bar is situated smack in the middle of one of the dirtiest, toughest, wildest neighborhoods anywhere. 8th Avenue, just off 42nd Street. Anything can happen here, and does. Mom stagger along the street, holding on to lampposts and garbage cans for support. Street hustlers offer marijuana, cocaine. Well-dressed businessmen and women hurry to appointments uptown. High school students dodging traffic run across the street to the Port Authority bus terminal. Sheldon Nadelman watches the action from inside the terminal bar, just as he's watched it for the past 10 years as the bar's manager and bartender. The street's gonna get you. <laughs> gonna get you. There's no way you're gonna survive. You gotta be the best. And you're gonna see these, all these people disappear from the street. The street eats them alive. Nadelman remembers the faces well. For the last 10 years, he's been taking pictures of customers inside the bar and the derelicts and wanderers outside. Through these doors, says Paul, one of the regulars, pass some of the most miserable people on earth. The majority of people who come here are on some kind of medication to keep them stabilized. Most of them are destitute, Paul says. He looks at Nadelman. If he doesn't get a job, he'll be destitute too. Destitute, Nadelman corrects him. The terminal bar closes for good tomorrow. The lease is up and owner Murray Goldman, Nadelman's father-in-law, doesn't think the place is worth the increased rent the landlord is asking. $125,000 a year. is not much to look at inside or out. The exterior is gray and grimy and the sidewalk smells of urine. The interior is drafty but there's plenty of room and nearly 200 bottles of liquor from which to make drinks. And that's me doing my chemistry thing. <laughs> well, we, like you take uh, Gordon's gin, which is, I don't know, it's 80 proof or 86 proof, it doesn't matter. When we get a cheaper 86 proof, clear, we place the Gordon's gin. 10 years I was there, nobody ever knew the difference. We did it with gin, we did it with scotch, we did it with cognac. But all the bars in New York do that. Right. Remember that. <laughs> you have professional fighters come in here, Paul says. Email Griffith is a customer, Nadelman says proudly. We have actors here too. Gene Tierney comes here. And we have an awful lot of cooks too. If you drop the bomb on this place, he says laughing. All the restaurants in New York would be out of business. A lot of them work in kitchens. A lot of cooks. A lot of cooks came in there. What was the majority of the clientele? Gay men. Gay black men. A banner announces open house on New Year's, featuring Ruth Brown. That's not the famous Ruth Brown, Paul says, but Ruth Brown, the uh, female impersonator. At the terminal, anything goes. It's the Bar One magazine called New York City's Toughest.
The complexion of the bar has changed over the past 15 years. Once it was home to the Hell's Kitchen crowd, burly Irishmen looking for a brawl and some booze. Mary Goldman remembers. If you think the crowd here is rough, you should have been here when we had the real street fighters. They would smash everything in sight. But the next day they would come back to say they were sorry. And they would pay for the damage. Now, nobody has the money to buy a drink, much less pay for what they break. This is Rodriguez. That was your grandfather's buddy. They would play horses all the time. Rodriguez had an accent you can cut with a knife. He was retired. He died while I was working the bar. Drinking related, but he was lucky he died in his uh, hotel room. You know what I mean? He didn't have to go to the hospital and drag it on like a lot of guys wound up going in and out of hospitals. He was there every day till he died. And unless he was sick, he was there every day. 812 was one of the old timers. The grandfather's regulars. He wasn't around till the end though. I don't know what happened. He was just a nice little guy. He was around for a few years. He just used to come in and sit by Murray. Nice old guy. You know my friend Frankie Banana? That's his father. He was Joe DiMaggio's barber. He worked at the Plaza Hotel. Bob at the Plaza. Nice guy. I don't think he worked a day in his life. 96 years old. Here he is walking the streets, coming at 25 cent beer. A couple of years. Then he comes in one day, give me a Coke. Why Coke? My doctor told me to stop drinking beer. <laughs> Some of these guys were oblivious to who was in the bar, and he was one of them. This was a mission guy. He loved all the prostitutes. Some old Jewish guy always coming in. He must have been in 80 something then. Have his two or three shots of something, and he's always going around out looking for these girls. He was such a wise guy, you know, such a New Yorker, a real, you know, Jewish through and through. Well, he was around for a while. He was just like a runner. He was from the old group of customers before the bar started really becoming gay. His clientele all got older. Mm -hmm. Alcohol kicked them all in the ass. They were gone. You, the the old timers, you'll see the pictures like Rodriguez and a few of the others. You see how beat they are. So you can imagine the ones that don't come in. You can't make it anymore. Mm -hmm. So the young wave, a new wave comes in. There was the new wave was gay because the young, the next wave of young people weren't coming into the terminal bar. That. So if you want to stay in business, you go with the flow. If it's gay, you got a gay bar. Leon. Leon was a school teacher in Brooklyn. He came from the South, I think North Carolina. I met him right from the beginning. I got pictures of him all the way through. You got to see how he deteriorated over the years. He was stabbed. He brought home a trick, you know, him and uh, this other gay guy picked up a trick in the street. Drunk, he was drunk, always drunk. Brought him to his apartment. Guy pulled a knife. Killed him. Killed him. Killed him. Oh, he came into my life and I don't know his name. Oh, Sandy. Sandy came into my life. Sandy was an elevator operator around the corner. And he was gay, but he was married and he had two children. Both wound up in the penitentiary. This picture always dumbfounded me. Here he's got all this ink on his shirt. And here there's no ink. They had a big fight that day, him and Tommy. They were all <laughs> they were lovers. Demented. <laughs> Drinking, fighting. Hitting one another. There were three brothers, all gay, and one of the brothers, was, his name was Princess. They were all gay. And the, the father was gay, too. This is Jimmy Jones. Jimmy Jones was a regular. He loved you. He loved your grandfather. He liked me, too. And he drank Canadian Club, which wasn't Canadian Club. <laughs> he drank it for 10 years I was there. He had a special glass, you know, special glass, got Jimmy Jones glass.
This is Van. Van was a good dude. But they drank, they used to drink uh, cognac. He worked with Van, and he was they were chefs, they were cooks. I know Van for 10 years, I knew him for 10 years. I don't know how he survived where they drank. Nadelman looks at the terminal's muscular bartender, who everyone calls Jersey. There's always something going on, Nadelman says, especially with Jersey here. He's the authority on the whole world. A regular comes in the bar with bottles of air freshener. He sprays the lemon scent around the bar, asking Jersey and the others if they want to buy a bottle too. I'm not going to buy anything from you, Jersey says laughing. You sold me those hankies for eight dollars a piece, and they came back from the laundromat smaller than a Ritz cracker. Jersey reaches behind the bar to push a buzzer. Someone wants to get in the bathroom, and the buzzer opens the door. Well, that's to ensure privacy. Paul explains. 1209 was 86 by your grandfather. He says he caught, caught him giving somebody a blowjob in the men's room. <laughs> But I let him in the bar on Saturdays. As long as your father, your grandfather wasn't there, I let him in the bar. Blow job, who gives a shit? He never walked in the bar sober. But he was so funny. See, if you're funny and you know, don't bother, I'll put up with you. You know what I mean? I put up with a lot of guys. There was a fucking nut. <laughs> But he was so funny. <laughs> but I knew the street was gonna get him. I don't know if he could use a pimp or whatever, but he could talk. 10 11 had a big mouth. <laughs> He's a big husky black man. But if they have a few drinks, they all become sissies. <laughs> oh, 07 is Adam. He's in a lot of pictures. He was uh, an important part of the show for quite a while. Just that he was around, you know. Even when he was in the bar, I felt comfortable. Because there was times where you feel comfortable with the, you got a certain group of assholes in the place, you know. And it's always nice to know there's somebody there that you can depend on. But he was always good and I knew how to treat him, you know. Which is important. Not that I treated anybody differently. If you were an asshole, fuck you, you're out there. I mean, I just, no holds barred. Goodbye, it's goodbye. 320 was a nasty ass wine, no? He was 86. I wouldn't let him drink in the bar. And he was Adam, he was a good friend of Adam. Just say so he was just one of them nasty motherfuckers. Uh, fuck you, let's see. Let's see. Number 21 came into my life. Bad news. He was 86. They come show up in life. They think they're gonna take over the world. <laughs> Nine out of times they're drunk. That's a big edge. Big edge. All you gotta do is call momentum. You walk up, you don't have to even swing. You just grab them and push. And there's no resistance. And once they're on the move, whatever's in the way, they're gonna hit. And they're gonna hit. This guy, 8603, he was out. You know, he came in, little short Mexican guy. Ah, bad, bad. Ah, bad, bad. You're not even gonna use the John, my man. He couldn't, I wouldn't let him drink in the bar. I couldn't drink in the bar. He was a shoeshine guy, pain in the fucking ass. 99% of the time they had too much to drink, you know what I mean? And they were drinking out in the street. They're drinking wine all day long out there. It's a wine room. They come in the bar, wanna play the jukebox, but they don't wanna drink. Conflict. So what do you do? Go behind the bar and you lower the jukebox, no sound. <laughs> That's it. Then they go. Three o'clock one Tuesday afternoon. It is not a bar hopping time. But the habitué of this bar 
have little regard for clocks. And so all 12 of the red and green stools are taken and customers are standing too deep in the miasma of smoke and rancid air. A disturbed man comes in, his hands describing circles, his conversation conducted with imaginary foes. Before he gets to the bar, Jersey has poured him his drink. He slobbers, nods his head, and walks out. Jersey throws the glass in the sink. Across the room, a junkie twitches. His head is almost in his beer. I know five, I don't know his name, but he was down there and he wound up a junkie somewhere. Not inevitable, but if you're there too long, that's what happened. 6 to 21, he's drinking too many straight shots early in the morning. I knew he wouldn't be around too long. He wasn't. I don't know what happened to him, but you're not going to make it. The third guy was a cop who wound up becoming a junkie. Being an alcoholic, hanging out in the bar, and knowing all of the yo-yos. A living on mine, Shelby, strange. Just strange. <laughs> oh, this guy just had to take his picture. Glassy eye, the hat. See, that would be a 16 by 20. This is Demented Soul, number four, Dare Show 4. I don't know if he ever entered my life again after that picture. He just walked in, looked like something out of space. I had to take his picture. He was ready, willing, and able. <laughs> Amazing. 522 couldn't talk. But he was still smoking and drinking. What's he trying to show in his photographs? I'm trying to tell people what's happening, Nadelman replies. If you don't put it down on paper, nobody knows. The people who come out of the Port Authority are so jaded. They come out there in the morning, step right over the bodies, and go to work. And they step over them on the way back, and nobody says nothing. When one person's lying in the street, everyone's lying in the street. The sounds are great. <laughs> There we go. One of my paybacks. Yeah. Ten years on that corner. That's a video store, huh? There was one entrance about over here, and there was one entrance on the side there. This the subway was right here. This was the subway entrance. And then as you went down, the bar went all the way up. There was a door here, the bar went up to here. There was a liquor store.
but there were there was three bars there and then there was another bar right over there i think that bus might still be there i don't know so you had four bars and two blocks plus a bar on the corner there in the port authority the entrance to the port authority bingo bingo the first thing they see is the terminal bar first thing has changed around here. Like nothing has changed. We got plenty of shit. See? They built a zillion dollars over there and this person is showing up. You, you could do your own documentary. All you gotta do is stay here for an hour. <laughs> you don't have to do 10 years. <laughs> One hour. Fabulous. Come to New York. New York shitty. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha